this session uh, recording up on the NL support website for those who may not be able to attend. So thank you for uh, again joining us today. I'm just going to admit a couple of other people that have just joined. So today we have Dr. John Fardy with us. Um, Dr. Fardy is a gastroenterologist and a professor of medicine at MUN. Uh, he's been teaching clinical epidemiology at the university for quite some time now, and he's going to be talking to us about uh, randomized controlled trials. Um, so with that, I will pass it along to Dr. Fardy to, to get started. All right. Uh, thanks, Julia, for that kind introduction. And I'd like to uh, thank Holly Etchigary as well for inviting me to do this today. I think this is a new experience for me. It's the first time I've ever been closed captioned, so I try not to look at what I'm saying, what I'm saying. What we're going to do today is talk about uh, randomized controlled trials, and I'm really going to try and provide an overview. So the things we're going to look at are the review the history of clinical trials, at least briefly. I'm going to focus on the methodology used to minimize bias in randomized controlled trials. We're going to discuss some of the ethical concepts underlying RCTs. I'm going to try to justify the intention to treat analysis of RCT data. I'm going to review some of the concepts around internal and external validity and finally look at the use of real world evidence to improve external validity. Many of you may be uh, familiar with this uh, pyramid of evidence that uh, you'll see in various uh, uh, sorts of uh, publications, and uh, it splits things into observational studies like cohort studies, case control studies, individual case reports at the bottom. Then we have randomized control trials and non-randomized control trials in the middle. And then finally, at the top of this evidence quality pyramid, we have meta-analysis, systematic reviews, and evidence-based guidelines. Uh, when we look at the risk of bias, uh, some would suggest that uh, the risk of bias becomes higher as you move down this pyramid. But actually, the things at the, the top of the pyramid are observational and probably more prone to bias than randomized controlled trials, which may, really seem to be perhaps uh, toward the top of that pyramid but rather than in the, the middle. And we're going to talk a little bit now about how uh, randomized controlled trials avoid bias, but first we're going to look a little bit about at the, the history. We're going to mention this guy, Austin Bradford Hill, a few times as uh, we move through this because he actually was involved in the first randomized controlled trial that was uh, done. Uh, and he's had a, no, a number of other research accomplishments. But back in 1984, he talked about clinical trials and suggested that at its best, a trial shows what can be accomplished with, with a medicine under careful observation and certain, under certain restricted conditions, and that the same results will not invariably or necessarily be observed when the medicine passes into general use. So I think he's putting a caveat there around uh, randomized controlled trials. And although I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes telling you how good randomized controlled trials are, we're going to get back to this sort of statement toward the end. So what are randomized controlled trials? Well, they are scientific experiments designed to test the benefit of drug treatment. Um, they make use of a variety of techniques to control bias, and bias is the evil thing that we're trying to avoid in uh, research. And the techniques that are used in randomized controlled trials include randomization, allocation concealment, controlling the treatment environment, and finally blinding. And the blinding can be of researchers, patients, outcome assessors, or statisticians. Um, and bias is the tendency to favor one group over another so that these techniques tend to help us avoid bias, avoiding 
that tendency to favor one group over another. So this is the sort of the basic diagram of a randomized control trial. Here on the left, you've got your uh, group of uh, subjects with the target disorder. They're going to be assigned randomly to either a treatment or control group. And then they're going to be followed up over time until they develop an outcome. And in this part, it looks like the outcome is that half their body turns blue. So we could call that hemicyanosis, which is, I'm only kidding around there. But anyway, the outcome here, we will assess toward the end of the trial. And that would be, uh, we would compare the results in those two trials. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about these trials. But first, we're going to talk about the history of uh, clinical trials and controlled trials. And we're going to start with a guy, James Lind, who was a surgeon in the Royal Navy. And in 1747, he had a bunch of men on the ship with scurvy, which was rampant uh, in the Royal Navy at that time. And he allocated these people. And he decided who was going to get which treatment between six different treatments. So cider, seawater, a mixture of horseradish, mustard and garlic, nutmeg, elixir, vitriol, or oranges and limes. Um, and in this trial, he selected those 12 patients who he thought had cases that were as similar as he could have them. So he was trying to have a group at the beginning that were equal. And he put them all together in one place in the ship and fed them all the same diet, with the exception of these different treatments, which he was uh, allocating. And two each of these people got uh, two each got each of these treatments. And the two who were given citrus fruit improved within days. Uh, and despite this obvious uh, improvement and success of citrus fruit in the treatment of scurvy. Lind hesitated to recommend the therapy because oranges and lemons were too expensive. And it was 50 years actually before the British Navy adopted lemon juice as a compulsory part of the seafarer's diet. So even at that time, we can see that uh, health economics was uh, playing an important part in uh, therapy. So now we're gonna move 200 years ahead of that. Uh, to the first randomized controlled trial, which took place in 1947, and looked at the use of streptomycin for pulmonary tuberculosis. So at that time, tuberculosis was endemic in the United Kingdom and other places in the world with a fairly high morbidity and mortality. Penicillin, which had just come on the scene, appeared to be no benefit for tuberculosis, although useful for other infectious diseases. And streptomycin had just been isolated from a fungus like uh, penicillin had been. And streptomycin seemed to work well in the test tube against tuberculosis. And it worked in guinea pigs with tuberculosis. Here's the, one of those successfully treated guinea pigs here. There was anecdotal evidence that it worked in patients, but it was expensive and there were only limited quantities available. So the Medical Research Council in Britain decided to run a multi-center controlled trial. And now we'll come back to Alston Bradford Hill because he was a professor of medical statistics at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And he proposed that this trial use a randomization process because he was concerned that without a randomization process that bias might be introduced. Now, the other things that Austin Bradfield Bradford Hill is famous for, and you might be more familiar with those, is that he did some of the early case control studies that showed the association between lung cancer and smoking. And there are actually Bradford Hill criteria for causation that some of you may have uh, run into. So he might be perhaps more famous for those things than for the randomization, but the, the randomization schedule for this first randomized control trial was actually proposed by Austin Bradford Hill. So this is the population, uh, the, the uh, sort of uh, way that this trial was run. The population was patients aged 15 to 30. They had to have progressive bilateral pulmonary tuberculosis as shown in this uh, chest x-ray. 
they were looking for people who had presumably recent onset disease incident cases that were bacteriologically proven and unsuitable for perhaps what was standard therapy at the time, which was lung collapse therapy. The intervention was streptomycin plus bed rest and the control group had bed rest alone. And the outcome that we're gonna look at is mortality at six months, although there were a number of other outcomes that they looked at in this trial. And this is just a, an example of what bed rest looked like in a tuberculosis hospital uh, in the 1940s in Britain. And I guess these people are outside to take in the ear, but this is what the control group would have had and the treatment group in this uh, study would have had uh, streptomycin in addition to the bed rest. So the trial methods involved subjects being identified by consultants at the time of diagnosis. Information was sent to a coordinating center, and if they were eligible, they were then admitted to the nearest participating hospital. And this is uh, the description of the randomization that was done in this uh, study. Each hospital was allocated a series of envelopes bearing only the hospital name. And in each envelope, there was a card that had either S for streptomycin or C for control group. In each hospital, there was one set of envelopes for men and one set for women. Neither the patient or the consultant were aware of the treatment allocation until that envelope was opened. And the numerical order of the S's and the C's within these envelopes was based on a series of random numbers. So this is a true randomization process. And it's actually relatively sophisticated because it's stratified both by gender and by hospital. And they've utilized something called allocation concealment, which means that neither the patient nor the researcher knew which treatment the patient would get until the envelope was open. So a fairly sophisticated randomization schedule. Streptomycin and control patients uh, were admitted to different wards, but otherwise treated exactly the same. And prior trials had been controlled, but used an alternate treatment assignment so that if someone came in and the first guy got streptomycin, the second one control, the third one streptomycin, the fourth one control. So not a true randomization. And Bradford Hill was concerned about selection bias, which is why he uh, suggested the, the randomization procedure. And because of that, the end result of this was the first randomized controlled trial. Now, you may wonder what random numbers are, but this is part of a random numbers table, and lots of statistics books have random number tables in the back of them. And what you would do is look at a series of these numbers, and you could say that I'm going to look at the last digit, and I'm going to go across the rows sequentially, and if it's an even last digit, I'll put this person in the treatment group. If it's odd, they'll go in the control group. So here you'd have treatment, control, treatment, control, treatment control, then treatment, treatment. So that's how a table of random numbers would work. And this is actually part of a, a much larger uh, random numbers table. And these things, I mean, you could decide that you're gonna start at E1 and you're gonna use the third digit and you're gonna use even or odd, or you could say that zero to four is gonna get treatment and five to nine is gonna get control. So there's a variety of numbers you could use, ways you could use a random numbers table. People don't use these tables anymore. Typically, they'll just go to a random numbers generator to generate numbers that you can then use to assign treatment or control. But this is a true randomization process. So why go to this trouble? What are the benefits of randomization? Well, Bradford Hill's major concern was about selection bias. He was concerned that the, if the investigator knew that this patient had had streptomycin, he would then know that the next patient was gonna get control if they were using an alternate assignment. And knowing that that patient may, was gonna go into the control group might influence his decision as to whether to admit this patient to the trial or not. So that's what Bradford Hill was concerned about. By using a true randomization process, 
neither the investigator or the subject know to which group they're going to be allocated to. So that is very important in terms of, and a really important part of the blinding in a randomized controlled trial is allocation concealment. And it really is one of the most important parts of the blinding that you can do in a randomized controlled trial. The other thing about randomization, other than the fact that it controls for selection bias, is that it also controls for known and unknown confounders in each of the treatment arms. And confounders are factors that can affect outcome. And with a randomization process, you're going to hope that those factors will be randomly distributed through the groups. And therefore, that confounders will be controlled, and even when they're unknown confounders. And I'll show you a slide that will demonstrate that in a second. Having equal groups at the beginning is very, a very important part of a randomized controlled trial because the statistical models that we use to look at outcomes assume that the groups are equal at the onset. If the groups are not equal at the onset, then the results of the statistical tests that we use to compare groups may not be valid. So this is a very important thing to have equal groups at the beginning. So this is just a, an example of a randomization process that is carried on. Here we have a, a group of subjects, and we can think that perhaps the blue subjects have a, a poor prognosis compared to the green subjects. And if we put them through this randomization process, we have here six in each group, and we have an even mixtures of blues and greens within each group. So it looks like the randomization was useful in equally distributing this prognostic factor that we were aware of into both of these groups. So that's good, that's what we would like to see. But the other beauty of this randomization process is that even prognostic factors that we're not aware of will tend to be equally distributed. And you may not have noticed in this group of 12, but there's four people here who are a little bit standoffish. They might be trying to keep their two meters apart because they're afraid they're going to get COVID. Uh, but of those standoffish people, even though we don't know that this is a prognostic factor that is of importance, we have two standoffish people in each group. So that's the beauty of the randomization is that it tends to distribute prognostic factors equally between the two groups. And we really want to have these two groups equal at the beginning of the trial. We'll see a little bit more about that in a second. So this then is the essence of a randomized control trial, is that you have a, a group of subjects with a target disorder. They undergo randomization. And hopefully, as Bradford Hill suggested, this helps to avoid selection bias, providing that we're using allocation concealment. And as well, it tends to give us two equal groups at the beginning of the trial. Once the, those two equal groups enter the trial, then they're gonna be treated exactly the same except for the treatment. And by blinding participants, researchers, outcome assessors, statisticians, you can help to make sure that the, the two groups are treated exactly the same through the course of the trial. And then at the end, you assess the outcome. And if you have two equal groups at the beginning, and if you treat them all exactly the same through the course of the trial, except for the treatment, you can then say that any differences that you see in the groups at the end of the trial are due to the treatment. And this is really the the essence of the randomized control trial. And it is what makes it such a powerful tool in terms of assessing the efficacy of therapeutic interventions. So this is just a, an example of a recent randomized control trial, fairly recent early release in the CMAJ in uh, just uh, a month ago. 
I think Dr. Peter Daly is signed into this today, and he was actually one of the authors of this. I, um, and Thanks for referencing this, John. Good trial. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd be happy about that, Peter. That's, but that's not why I put it there. <laughs> so really what I wanted to demonstrate is just the, the results of the randomization process uh, with this trial. And what I'll mention here is that table one in almost any randomized control trial will be showing the demographics and the prognostic factors associated with the treatment and control groups. And table one is meant to convince you that these two groups are equal at the beginning of the study. So here we can see that the, the results of the randomization, we had 634 in one group, 647 in another. That's just due to the, uh, the way that the randomization doesn't necessarily give you exactly the same groups. Uh, but the, you can see that the age, average age in the two groups is almost identical. There are about 40% of women in both the groups. The frailty scores, time from symptom onset to hospital admission, and time from symptom onset to randomization are identical in the two groups. And perhaps more importantly, when you look at the presence of what I think would be very important prognostic indicators for this group, that would be the presence of chronic respiratory disease, asthma, and smoking, these are very evenly distributed between the two groups. And this is the beauty of the randomization process is that it does tend to give you two fairly equal groups at the beginning of the study. Now, this is somewhat dependent on numbers. This is a relatively big trial. We've got uh, almost 1,300 patients all together here. Um, so, or more than 1,300 patients, well, almost 1,300 patients all together here. And the more patients there are, the better off you are, or the more certain you can be that the randomization will actually produce two equal groups. And we can say that not only will this two groups be equal in terms of these prognostic factors that we are aware of, also if there were other prognostic factors like being standoffish, for instance, we would expect that they would be equally distributed between these two groups as well. So uh, that really is the beauty of the randomization. So if we go back to the MRC, MRC trial and uh, the oh, sorry, MRC trial and the, their table one in this MRC trial, and we looked at the results of their randomization, it was pretty effective in terms of giving an equal number of males and females in both groups, 40% in both groups. The reason that that turned out so well is because they actually stratified for gender so that they randomized male and female patients uh, separately. And that's what gives them uh, such an equality in the number of uh, males and females in both groups. So if you do stratify the randomization like that, you can almost guarantee that you have equal numbers of whatever prognostic factor you're, you're looking at. And in this case, it was gender. They weren't so lucky in terms of prognostic factors like general condition that seemed to be a little bit worse in the streptomycin group. Temperatures were a little bit higher, which was a prognostic factor. And as well, the ESR was a little bit higher in that streptomycin group. Fortunately, it turned out that streptomycin still, that group still did better than the control group. So that this slight imbalance uh, following the randomization uh, did not affect the results. But that is the chance that you take when you're randomizing things, because these things happen due to chance. And particularly when you have smaller numbers here, you've got just over 100 patients as compared to the 1,300 in the previous trial. So that the randomization will not work as well. And you may have to use strategies like stratification to ensure that very important prognostic factors are distributed equally between the two groups. So these are the results of this uh, MRC trial of streptomycin. And you can see the six month mortality, four of 55 patients in the streptomycin group died 
within that first six months as compared to 15 of 52 within the control group. So the, that's a 7.2% mortality rate versus 28.8% mortality rate. So a significant difference here. Odds ratios, if you like them, was 0 0.28. And the p-value was 0 0.03. So they had a statistically significant result. What they did notice, however, that there was resistance to streptomycin developing as early as four months into therapy, and that there were some adverse effects like ototoxicity. So again, streptomycin was not the silver bullet for tuberculosis. But you'll notice that compared to the streptomycin group, there were, you could say, 11 excess deaths within that control group. And that might lead you the, to ask the question then, we're gonna talk about ethics just for a second, as to whether it is ethical to deny subjects with a potentially life-threatening disease access to a promising new therapy. Um, and the essence of allocating patients to different treatments within clinical trials is based on the presence of clinical equipoise. And that just means that we don't know if the drug that we're going to use as our experimental treatment is any better than standard therapy. In order, a fancy way to say that is that the equality regarding the probability of benefit must exist between two or more groups being compared in the study and that this provides the ethical basis for medical research that involves assigning patients to different treatment arms of a clinical trial. So if we really don't know if the treatment is effective or safe, then we're quite justified in randomizing people within a randomized controlled trial. The fact that we've randomizing them is helpful and the blinding throughout the trial can be helpful as well uh, in terms of this. But we need to be in a state of clinical equipoise in order to randomize people into one treatment or another. And the other, one other important ethical concern is that about informed consent. These are not, this is not uh, an overarching review of the ethics of randomized controlled trials, but certainly informed consent is one of the, the basics that we. Uh, look for in, uh, in randomized controlled trials. And really subjects need to be aware of the potential risks and benefits of participation, including the fact that they're being randomized to treatment. Interestingly enough, the subjects in the streptomycin trial were not aware they even that they were participating in a research study and they did not provide informed consent. But this was in 1947, which was a year before the Nuremberg Code uh, came out and then much earlier than the Declaration of Helsinki and the Tri-Council Policy Statement. So the Nuremberg Code uh, came out in 1948 as a response to some of the experimentation that occurred during the Second World War uh, and outlined sort of guidelines for human experimentation. The Declaration of Helsinki, which came out in 1964 and has been revised a number of times since then, talks about the same sorts of things. In Canada, we tend to look at the Tri-Council Policy. We don't tend to look at it. We do look at this as if it is a Bible in a sense. And it provides ethics guidance for all research involving human participants. And certainly, there's a whole big chapter in this uh, document regarding uh, informed consent. So it's a very important part of uh, randomized control trials. So now we're going to move from ethics to the concept of an intention to treat analysis. Uh, and as an example here, we're going to look at the uh, trial where we've uh, got patients with some underlying disorder and they've been randomized to either surgery or to medical therapy. The darker circles here are patients who have a very poor prognosis. And after randomization, these patients with a poor prognosis actually die before they have surgery. 
They do make it into the, the medical treatment group, however, but at the end of the study, these two patients have died as well, so that there's six of eight alive in the medically treated group, and all six of the patients who actually were operated on are alive at the end of the study. So the question then is, how do we analyze this data? Obviously, in terms of the medical group, there's only one way to look at this, 75% survived. But what about the surgical group? Do we say that they have 100% survival after surgery, or should we include subjects who did not receive the assigned treatment? And that's a question that some people think that, you know, if they didn't even get a chance to have the operation, how can you include them and they should be eliminated? But there are reasons to maybe include these patients in the analysis. And this is the basis then of a decision regarding an intention to treat versus a per protocol analysis. So an intention to treat analysis is based on the assumption that all subjects will be analyzed according to the group to which they were randomized. And this maintains the randomization. And when we talked about the importance of randomization in terms of having two equal groups at the beginning of this study, then obviously it is important to maintain the randomization so that for a purist like me, the intention to treat analysis is going to wait is the way to go because I want to guard against bias and maintain the benefits of that randomization because it is equal groups are the theoretical basis for the statistical tests of significance. And we could argue that this may be help to, helps to measure effectiveness of treatment as compared to efficacy. A per protocol analysis analyzes subjects according to the treatment which they receive. And the problem with this is that some of the benefits of randomization may be lost, we may introduce bias, and it can invalidate the statistical tests to a certain extent. And some could argue that this actually measures efficacy. So if we go back to our trial, then the, in the intention to treat result, we would say that of the eight that were randomized, six survived, and therefore the survival rate was 75% in the surgical group, which was identical to the medical group. And this may actually be a better measure of real world effectiveness of surgery if subjects are dying even before they can have surgery. So if you decide to operate on someone but they die before you can get them to the operating room, then obviously uh, that's not a very effective therapy for that person. And if they are dying before surgery, even in the context of a randomized controlled trial where things happen fairly uh, expediently, then in the real world, these patients are probably not going to do well with surgery. A per protocol result would suggest that the survival in the surgical group was 100% versus that in the medical group. And proponents of this may suggest that people just need more timely access to surgery. Although another interpretation of that is that some patients may in fact be too sick for surgery. I think overall that the intention to treat analysis really should always be the primary analysis. If the intention to treat analysis, however, does not show benefit for your treatment, then it is useful sometimes to look at a per protocol analysis to see if there is any benefit to treatment that could in fact be uh, tweaked a little bit uh, in so that the per protocol analysis can give you some idea if it, the treatment is efficacious at all. But the default should always be an intention to treat analysis. And that's what typically what you'll see uh, done in randomized controlled trials. So randomized controlled trials are very good. They're so good that they're used uh, in terms of drug approval by the FDA. And uh, what they're saying here is that uh, Randomized controlled trials are adequate and well-controlled clinical investigation with includes randomization, blinding, well-defined endpoints, and that these really are the gold standard for determining efficacy of therapy. 
with the randomized double-blinded concurrently controlled superiority trial regarded as the most rigorous design. And often these are the designs that are used uh, to determine uh, drug efficacy and uh, to determine approval by boards such as the FDA and uh, the, the European drug agencies and others, as well as Health Canada, I should add. So RCTs are good, but they may not be perfect. Uh, and one of the big limitations of randomized clinical trials is the external validity or the generalizability of results from randomized controlled trials. And we're gonna to speak to that again in a second. Other problems are related to the relatively short treatment interval a lot of these drug trials uh, outcomes will be measured at 16 or 24 weeks, which is not necessarily a long time on a drug. So that long-term efficacy is not demonstrated. The true adverse effect profile may not be demonstrated either. Rare adverse effects may not show up in clinical trials and long-term adverse effects may not show up as well because of the relatively short treatment duration. And there is a concept of drug persistence as well, which is staying on a drug over a long period of time. This can be related to therapeutic goals like blood sugar and diabetes or symptom control like diarrhea and ulcerative colitis, or that the drugs are well tolerated. So this is sort of a composite index of how well a drug is working. Uh, and really RCTs don't look very much at persistence because they don't go on long enough. Typically an RCT might end somewhere out around here, whereas this is a, a study of monotherapy in people with hypertension, and it showed that people were dropping off these drugs over time, and that valsartan, which is on the top here, was actually more persistent in terms of therapy than the other three, and this was a statistically significant result. And it appeared that the other three had more adverse effects, and that's why patients were no longer taking them, even though they were all equally effective at uh, controlling blood pressure. So this is the type of long-term data that you may not be able to glean from a randomized controlled trial, but you may be able to get from what we're going to call real-world evidence. In terms of external validity and generalizability, the big issue with randomized controlled trials is going to be the characteristics of the patients, because the inclusion and exclusion criteria tend to be fairly strict as we're trying to maintain internal validity. And the internal validity of a trial is the degree to which the results of the observations are correct for the patients being studied. This can be threatened by bias within the trial and random variation, and we control this by the things we do in the trial and by the statistical tests we use. But really in trials, we try to have a homogeneous trial population in order to increase the internal validity and randomization, allocation, concealment, and blinding can help with that. But the problem is that this decreases external validity because the very strict inclusion criteria the sampling bias, because a lot of these trials tend to be carried out in tertiary care centers, and the very controlled environment of clinical trials where compliance is uh, uh, measured and uh, almost assured, do not necessarily reflect the real world environment. So this is just a, an example of what might happen with populations in terms of a, a randomized clinical trial. This is a GI. Um, example, because I'm a gastroenterologist, so say I had a, a new drug that I was interested in for looking at a particular type of Crohn's disease where you develop fistulas, and I might want to be picky and say that I don't want to have these patients had any previous surgery, and I don't want them to have previous biological therapy, so this is sort of the population that I've picked. And then out of that population, in terms of the ones that are eventually going to be eligible to come into the trial, it's only going to be a very small proportion of the population that I've picked. And this is only a small proportion of all the patients with fistulizing Crohn's disease. And this really is only a very small 
proportion of all the patients with Crohn's disease. So are the results that we see in this very select group generalizable to everyone with fistulas and Crohn's disease and to everyone with Crohn's disease in general? And the answer is perhaps not. That really brings us to the concept of real world evidence and how it differs from evidence from randomized controlled trials. So this slide, I think, gives us a good idea about what the difference is. So in randomized controlled trials, we're going to be closely monitored uh, to look for benefit and harm. We've got a design that minimizes bias with high internal validity. And, but unfortunately, we have restricted entry criteria and possibly unrepresentative settings. And this is, we could think of this as what the population looks like in a randomized controlled trial. In the real world, however, where we might measure efficacy or effectiveness of drugs in perhaps a pragmatic clinical trial, and I'll show you what that is in a second, or in observational studies, we tend to get populations that are a lot different than the, the population we see in the randomized controlled trial. But at the same time, these populations are perhaps much more representative of the people that we see in our clinics. So when we look at the randomized controlled trial, we have predefined inclusion exclusion criteria, very rigorous data collection, strict monitoring, relatively short follow-up with frequent visits, high medication adherence, usually hard outcomes that are easy to met, that uh, provide good data. We have excellent data quality. Unfortunately, they are expensive, but th these are of value to regulatory authorities and to clinicians. On the other hand, we have real world observational studies, and this could be data that might come out of health plans like Kaiser Permanente or out of disease registries where patients are, are followed. This is real world data, which is gleaned from routine clinical care, much longer follow up with no mandatory visits. Patients are just treated the way that they normally would be treated in, in terms of their clinical care. Adherence may be low, as it does tend to be. Uh, and the data that you use is dependent on that that's captured at patient clinic clinician interactions in the clinic. Data quality may be questionable, but if there is low cost to patient. And traditionally, this type of data can be of value to payers and to clinicians because it gives us an idea of what happens in the real world. A pragmatic clinical trial is really it can be a randomized controlled trial, but it is much less stringent in terms of inclusion and exclusion criteria. You tend to do more than just you randomize them to one drug or the other, and then you have routine clinical care after that. There may be longer follow-up with fewer visits. So it's kind of a mix between this real world evidence and the very strict randomized controlled trial. So if we look at the difference between these two models, then the RCT gives us clinical efficacy and safety. We have randomization to minimize bias and confounding. But we do have the question of questionable external validity and generalizability. The controlled setting is good in terms of measuring outcomes, but not so good in terms of what reflecting what happens in the real world. And we don't get to really look at the true value of this within a health system. Real world evidence can show us the effectiveness of a drug in clinical practice is much more generalizable and perhaps more representative of the patient population. Uh, and it's done in real world settings in busy practices where patients are actually treated. And it may better demonstrate the value of, of treatment for both patients and for the health system. Now, the problem is, is that once you get into the real world environment and you have a group of patients here who are being treated with one drug and a patient group of patients here have been treated with another, they may not be equal anymore. Not the type of equality that we, we have seen in the randomized controlled trial. 
So that does sort of limit our ability to compare treatment A with treatment B. But one of the methods that is used to do that is propensity score matching. And propensity scores are simply scores of prognostic variables. Uh, and here, if we look at patients, the bigger their circle, the more, the bigger their propensity score or the more prognostic factors they have that suggest a poor outcome, let's say. So if we give all of these people in this group propensity scores, we can then match them according to their propensity scores. These all have a bad, worse prognosis. These have a better prognosis. We can match them with propensity scores and then compare these two groups, which are somewhat equal, somewhat like we see in a randomized control trial. What we need to realize, however, is that we've left out data here. I'm just gonna show you <coughs> results from this sort of propensity matching that was done in an observational study. Before propensity matching, these two groups had unequal numbers of patients, not so important, but the gender makeup was different, employment status was different, a uh, number with a normal I and R was different. After propensity matching, they have equalized the average, the, the gender makeup, and they've equalized the employment status as well as the I and R. Um, so that propensity matching can give you two equal groups, but the problem is, is that you've lost a lot of data. So you have here 250 patients, whereas prior to that, you had more than 400 patients. So you do lose data when you're using this propensity score matching, but it is interesting the way that it can sort of simulate uh, randomization. But I, I would have to uh, warn you that it is not the same as a randomization process and you are losing data here. It still is observation. So I'd, I'd like to just finish off then back to our evidence uh, pyramid where with the quality of evidence we have RCTs here fairly high up on this uh, evidence pyramid and I would argue perhaps that they're uh, should be at the top of the pyramid. Some people would argue that real world evidence uh, produces a new paradigm and tips this pyramid over on its side, but I don't think that that's uh, actually the case. And in conclusion, I would suggest that randomized controlled trials are recognized as the gold standard for determining efficacy and safety of therapeutic interventions. Bias is mitigated by randomization, allocation, concealment, blinding, and control within the trial. An intention to treat analysis preserves the benefit of the randomization and should always be the default analysis. But the generalizability of results within RCTs may be limited primarily due to the populations that are enrolled in RCTs, but that real world evidence can provide complementary evidence of treatment of effectiveness, and you'll see a lot of uh, real world elements, evidence in the literature. So I'd like to finish there. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer those. Thanks, Dr. Fardy. Yes, so as, uh, as Dr. Fardy said, oh yeah, we have one question there in the chat. Um, could you please explain the difference between efficacy and effectiveness? Okay, that's a great question. Thanks uh, for asking that question. So uh, efficacy is really whether a drug in ideal situations works or not. Uh, that is efficacy. So that we can think of efficacy of something that you might see within a randomized controlled trial. You have very stringent conditions and under the best possible conditions, a trial will work or a drug will work. Effectiveness relates to what happens when that drug gets out into the general population and whether or not it continues to be effective. And the reason it may not be effective in that general population is because there may be adverse effects and people may not take the drug. It may be too expensive, so they don't, they don't take it. 
uh, it may not work as well in that general population as compared to how it worked in a clinical trial. So when we think of efficacy, it's how well a treatment works under ideal situation. And then uh, effectiveness is how well it works when it's actually put out into the real world. I hope that answers your question. I have a question, it's Peter Daly, uh, thanks John. Um, you didn't get into the biases related to corporate investment or funding or um, you know, these drugs come out of companies that are interested in profit, right? Do you wanna chat on that at all? No. <laughs> yes, I think that the obvious is important. And when you look at uh, the clinical practice guidelines, for instance, when I said that these are observational these clinical practice guidelines are often developed by people who have strong corporate ties and there may be significant corporate input put into some of these clinical practice guidelines. And that would be one example, I think, of where this corporate input can affect uh, decisions about treatment. So, you know, I think within a randomized controlled trial, I mean, certainly corporations decide which drugs they're going to test and they decide which populations they're gonna test. It's really up to clinicians to then sort out whether these drugs are gonna work in their populations. And you know, this concept of generalizability is a big problem for clinicians like you and I when we're trying to decide if drugs will work in our patients. So uh, you know, this is always on the back burner in terms of you know, corporate uh, input into these things. And you have to keep that in mind because these are big money uh, things that are happening. Holly, did you have something something to say? Yeah, sorry, I just didn't want to jump in. So, John, thanks very much for joining us as always. Uh, just to be transparent, I always bug John to do things with me about teaching and stuff, and uh, and he always says yes. So, thank you, John. I, I was thinking about stratification. I really like those two table ones that you showed, and showing you know when you have those larger numbers versus the smaller numbers you can see the difference of uh, did the randomization work in helping to balance out those factors. So just for folks maybe not overly familiar with some of the terms like stratification, I was thinking, you know, when you know you're going to have a small population, and for example, some of the work I do is with inherited disorders. So we know many of those populations are small. If you wanted to do a trial, you know that the numbers are small. Is that stratification on maybe a couple of key factors, your best bet, if, if you think you're just gonna have the small groups and the randomization may not be quite as effective? It is definitely your best bet. And okay. the example that I often use is a, a liver disease kind called primary biliary cirrhosis, where 95% of the people with PBC, it's not even primary biliary cirrhosis anymore, they changed the name, primary biliary cholangitis, but uh, most of the people with that disorder are females. If you were doing a trial of PBC, you definitely want to stratify for gender because you don't want to get an imbalance with those few males who have the disorder in one group and not in the other. So if right. there are important prognostic factors, it's really important to stratify for those and even more important when you have very small numbers, as you said, because that's when it's going to show up. Yeah. There was no stratification in that COVID trial because they didn't really need it because the larger numbers protect you when you're randomizing that many people. Yeah, makes sense. Perfect. Thanks, John. Yeah. I thought I saw Christy with her hand up. Or was Hi, that thank you very much. Okay, hi, Christine. <laughs> hi, thank you, yes. Um, I have a question about uh, real-world algorithms and randomized trial evidence. Um, speaking from someone who has, <clears throat> excuse me, complex chronic um, diseases, um, I often feel I'm never heard in those very biased, very gen non-generalizable um, randomized trials. So I'm just wondering, do you, do you see um, going forward um, more of an ethical implication in really considering the real world evidence in practice or making it more of a standard, I guess, add on for um, drug trials to really, really consider real world rather than just those very minute, you know, you know, 
40 day, 400 days, you know, a year and a half drug trials that really, in my mind, um, <laughs> for me, have, have no have no value because they're not really considering everything. And I never find myself, it's very hard for me to actually make sense of anything because they don't include me. Uh, thanks very much for that question. Yeah, I think the two were complementary, and I didn't really, I was trained as a clinical epidemiologist. So I really started to learn about real world evidence when I studied health economics on sabbatical about five years ago. And in terms of, that's when I really got sort of hooked on this real world evidence stuff. Uh, and I think the two are complementary. So you need the data from randomized controlled trials to really document the efficacy of a drug, but then you need to see real world evidence to see how effective that drug will be when it is put out into the population. So the two are complementary, And where you'll see this most apparent is in payers. So in these large health groups in the US where they're deciding what treatment you can have and what treatment you can't have, they look at the data from randomized controlled trials, but they also wanna see that real world evidence so that they can decide whether the drugs are effective and sometimes whether they're cost effective as well as another question that will come up. So this real world evidence is something that is, it's a booming industry, so to speak. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, use of real world evidence these days. So it really is complementary to what you see in the randomized controlled trial. I guess my, my question would also be is that, do you feel that there's going to be a much I mean, in Canada, um, you know, when I speak to my doctors, they really go back to those randomized trials rather than real world evidence. And real world evidence is dismissed as being um, not valid. And so I'm just wondering, is there a, I guess, a bigger push in Canada to really reinforce that how we live day to day actually has value? And is there like, is there an organization? Are there studies? Is, are there, is there a big push? There is, uh, I'm on the Health Research Ethics Board as well, so we see a lot of these uh, real world evidence studies coming through. So there's a lot of this work that is ongoing. And these doctors who may be pushing results of randomized controlled trials at you uh, in terms of uh, drugs are also getting real world evidence pushed at them by the people who sell drugs, particularly when that real world evidence is in favor of the drugs they're selling, uh, uh, to, show, to show how effective they are in the long term, to show that they are safe, because safety is one of the things that we look for in these long term studies, and to show persistence, which is this surrogate marker of how well a drug is going. If people stay on drugs for a long period of time, it suggests that they are both effective and free of adverse effects. Thank you very much for that um, more, uh, more complete uh, answer about how drug companies can be, also be beneficial in that process. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. I do see one more uh, comment in or question in the chat, uh, Dr. Fardy. So in randomized controlled trials, should we use placebo or standard of care as the control group? How should we choose? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, the FDA often wants to see placebo controlled trials. I think from an ethical point of view, you would prefer that you see standard of care being used in a randomized controlled trial so that you don't have to take patients off what might be standard therapy in order to put them in a clinical trial where they have to be randomized to the new therapy versus placebo. We do see that sometimes. And what we want to ensure is that that period off of treatment is not going to cause any adverse effects for the patients. So you wanna make sure that they're not gonna have any sort of uh, bad things happen by taking them off the standard of care. The problem with standard of care is that it is harder to show a difference when you're actually 
comparing a new treatment to what is standard care than it is if you're comparing a new treatment with placebo. Uh, so I think from my point of view, I would always like to see standard of care as being that control group. But when you're trying to show a difference between two groups, it's much easier to show it with a placebo. And sometimes in a trial where there's, it's a relatively short duration and there won't be uh, any adverse uh, effect for the patient, then you will see placebo being used in, in those situations. Thanks, Dr. Fadi. I don't see any other questions coming in and we have just reached our time. We're a couple minutes over. Um, oh, I see one more um, and then we'll, we'll close it off. Um, if we do crossover study in the randomized control trial, do we need two equal samples? Um, no, you don't have to have two equal samples. Um, equality gives you the best statistical bang for the buck, but if, I mean, even if you randomize depending on the size, then you may not have two equal groups. Uh, crossover studies are a little bit dicey because uh, I think the FDA will only accept the evidence from the first two arms of a crossover study before that crossover actually takes place. And there are a lot of sort of nitpicky things that can happen in a crossover study that you have to be careful of. So in, a, in some ways they are best avoided, but no, you don't have to have two equal groups. Thanks for that question, Teresa. Um, so I think we are nearing the end of today's session. Um, I will just thank uh, Dr. Fardy for, for a very interesting session. I think we covered a lot. Um, so just to let everyone know that we do have a couple of other sessions in our research design series um, coming up. So next week on Tuesday, we have a session on alternative study designs. And then following that, um, we, we get into our qualitative research methods. So we have a session from Dr. Holly Echigari, who's here today, uh, giving an intro to qualitative design. And then um, the following week will be a session on interpretive description. Um, so all of the events that we're hosting in the next couple of months are up on our website, uh, available for registration. We do have a uh, training program as well. Um, so you are eligible for a letter of completion if you complete uh, six sessions um, in a period of two years. So you just need to register for each event for that. Um, and again, I just want to thank Dr. Friday for a very interesting uh, session today uh, that's contribu contributing to our research design series. It's going very well. Um, if you have any questions about the session, or the training program or NL support in general, I'd be very happy to, to answer them. So please feel free to reach out uh, to me. My email is on the screen there. So if that's it, I'll wish everyone uh, a wonderful rest of your day. And thanks again, uh, Dr. Friday, for a great presentation. Thank you, Julia and Holly. Great, Bye -bye. thanks everyone. <laughs> thanks guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.